Hello and welcome everyone to the February 28th monthly meeting of the Hadley Public Schools uh, School Committee. Um, do I have a motion to um, open this meeting? So moved. Okay, do I hear a second? Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Excellent. Great. Um, uh, four of us are here. Heather um, sent her regrets um, and um, she did share um, some feedback, which we'll be able to uh, include in a later discussion um, and has weighed in on certain aspects of the agenda. Um, but it's just the four of us tonight, crew, um, and we'll make it an expeditious meeting. I think it's a pretty short, uh, short agenda. Um, any adjustments to the agenda, Annie? Oh, you're on mute. There I am. No, uh, there aren't. Except, okay. I'm sorry, I have a standing. We don't need executive session. Let me admit that. We do not, we will not be going into executive session. That's usually standing, a standing agenda item, but we do not need it tonight. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, we are going to go first into public comment. And just as a reminder, um, uh, Public comment is a time for the public to weigh in on items that we're discussing on today's agenda. Um, they are not items necessarily that we'll respond to directly, um, but we of course factor that into our, uh, our thinking. And um, we ask that you keep the comments to three minutes or less. Um, and we do seem to have a fair number of people, so we will be expeditious in making our way through any comments that are made. Um, to make a comment, we'd like you to raise your digital hand and we'll call you in the order in which we see your hand. And um, so I'm looking for hands. Um, seeing no hands, we will proceed right into the agenda. And the first item on the agenda is uh, a discussion item um, that has to do with the DESI mask requirement. Um, Annie. So as I informed families, DESI in conjunction with the Department of Public Health in Massachusetts lifted the mask requirement for K through 12 public schools effective February 28th. Um, CDC, when they initially, excuse me, when DESI initially sent out its guidance, um, it, its updated guidance, they indicated at that time that masks would still be required on school buses. On Friday, the CDC lifted that requirement. So the CDC is no longer requiring that um, masks are mandatory on school buses. They, um, just across the board, they recommend that communities look at community transmission rates in their community. Currently, I believe yesterday, Hampshire County was moderate and they recommend that when the transmission is moderate or low, that mask mandates can be lifted. The local board of health, Hadley Board of Health, had a mask mandate that was set to expire tonight at 11.59 p.m. Um, I believe that uh, what I sent out to folks is that their mask mandate for the town of Hadley will expire tomorrow, effective tomorrow, the mask mandate in the town uh, for indoor spaces is lifted. However, the mask mandate, they're recommending that schools maintain masks or continue to use masks uh, on Monday to have masks become optional. And just a reminder to people, anyone who would like to wear a mask is always welcome to wear a mask at any time. Nobody would ever be prohibited or folks who choose to wear a mask, we won't interfere in any way. There'll be adults and young people who may continue to make that choice. Um, so people always have that choice. Um, but that's where we are uh, right now. Great, thank you, Annie. Um, I'm going to uh, open it up for discussion from my colleagues. And before I do, I will read um, a, a letter that Heather shared with us. Um, she writes, I have read the Board of Health posting from Friday, February 25th, 2022. And she shares a link to that article. And I have some comments and concerns. Notably, I'm concerned about the differing dates 
for lifting mandatory indoor mask mandates between the town, which is March 1st, and the schools, which is March 7th. Hadley Public Schools are part of the town, and we've tried to follow national, state, and local guidance on mask mandates. The state, parentheses DESI, has indicated February 28th, the mask requirement will be lifted, and the town is lifting the mandates on March 1st. Our past practice has been to follow these guidelines. I understand a desire for caution following a school break period, but why has a differing date been established for the town and the schools? It is unclear to me whether the schools were consulted on this and absent any compelling rationale from a health and safety perspective, I do not support having a different implementation date. The schools should lift the mask mandate in conjunction with the town on March 1st. We are committed to continuing pool testing strategies, on-site health and safety protocol, communication, resources, and supports for families. And with these measures in place tomorrow, February 28th, with the return from school break week, we should have sufficient confidence in moving forward on March 1st with lifting the mask mandate along with other town entities and public spaces. Respectfully submitted, Heather Clash, school committee member. Um, I just wanna um, thank Heather for um, articulating her thoughts and um, sharing it um, despite not being able to attend. Thank you, Heather. Um, I'm gonna open it up to my colleagues to provide additional uh, comment. Oh, actually, before I do that, I wanna ask Annie, Annie, what, what is the rationale? Um, I was not at the local board of health meeting. However, it is my okay. understanding that some members of the community had expressed concern directly to the local board of health that lifting the mask mandate immediately following a school break may pose additional risk. Um, and I can certainly understand why uh, people would come to that conclusion, given the fact that we had such high case, uh, high rates of cases or numbers of positive cases in January. However, immediately following the Thanksgiving break, we did not see a similar spike. So it's difficult to know for certain whether or not it's solely children go on break and we see, in, we see a spike in cases, or as the CDC has suggested, when communities have high rates of transmission, then we then see higher rates in schools. So what we saw after December break was an incredibly high rate of transmission, not just in Hadley and all of the surrounding communities. Um, but I believe uh, what I was told is that that did factor into their decision and they uh, heard from members of the public who attended the meeting and expressed their desire to see the mask uh, expectation for masks in our schools to continue. Great, thank you, Annie. Can I just add one thing to that, to Annie, that I was thinking about um, as you were talking. Um, it's 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 challenging with this virus because it's not apples to apples as well, right? So we didn't see an uptick in November, but we didn't have Omicron, and that's when we saw the uptick. So we're seeing it in different strains. So it's just a it's it's. It's just not equal comparisons, right? When we're looking at this, we didn't have Omicron then. Delta was starting to slow down at that point. And then Omicron hit really right at right mid what mid-December. So it's just for whatever things that we're thinking about here. Variance difference in transmissibility um, could have played into those numbers. That's all I wanted to say. Thanks, Sarah. So, Annie, I take it by your the way you responded. They didn't communicate this with you. They didn't talk to you about this at all. I, I certainly don't want to say they didn't talk to me about this at all. Actually, Dr. Mosler did reach out to me, uh, asked me for some input. I always share the dashboard with her. I went over the dashboard with her because we've seen some that cases have declined significantly, we're seeing fewer and fewer cases. I did also explain that um, I knew at that time that the CDC was recommending that communities are considering looking at metrics like hospital capacity, explained that I didn't keep track of that for the community. 
Um, so I wouldn't be able to weigh in on that. But I also said, as always, we've looked to the Board of Health to offer us guidance over the last two years, and they've been quite helpful and shown up. And I just made it clear that, um, of course, we would always um, take their guidance and, and uh, respond thoughtfully and, and take that definitely into consideration. But Paul, I wasn't, I wasn't asked directly what, what I expected or wanted, nor would I expect them to do that. I mean, really, I say over and over again, I look to State Department of Public Health and the local Board of Health to make recommendations. And I've tried really hard for the past few years to consistently remind people that I'm not a health expert, don't want to be one. And I don't think the school committee wants to appoint itself as right, its own autonomous group of health experts. I think we've done a really good job of staying away from that. We're trying to. So I don't want to. Well, I think there is. I, I understand. I think there's a middle ground, though. I, I guess that is disappointing. I understand the Board of Health has been good partners and appreciate it. But um, if, uh, as you said, a few group of the public persuaded them, and I know that those are your, and I'm not sure exactly, it'd be helpful to understand their reasoning, right? Why is it different than DESE? What are the indicators? What are they gonna do between now and the seventh? Are they looking for anything in particular if they're trying to monitor between um, uh, February break and seventh? Are they looking at different metrics? Are they reconvening before the seventh? Are they gonna make another decision? Do we know any of this? I don't believe so. I don't believe so. I, I it so is my understanding understand. again, and I have to be careful with this because I wasn't at that meeting, but my understanding from speaking with somebody who was there is that it was in response to um, some input from the public and that um, taking the break into consideration was something that may be important. It's just disappointing. I mean, I don't, if they have a reason, they it'd be helpful if they came in and explained it and you know, what are they gonna do with that data? What are they doing with this week? If they find something, something might change. It's just a precaution. I mean, if, if the rationale is they want to see a week after and what? So, I mean, it's just a week, it's unfortunate, um, but I, and I, I know this is gonna sound snarky, but we have no choice, right? We have to follow what they say. Um, Seems like we do. Yeah, I mean, I, I, the school committee is a is an autonomously elected board, um, right. so I do believe that you can pass your own policy. However, I don't know the specific answer to the extent to which the board of health can enforce these recommendations yeah. of the departments. I don't know the answer. That. Yeah, and it's I'm not pushing that. Legal it's, sense. I, don't, I know, I don't. and I'm not pushing that. It's more procedural. Right? They're, getting, they're treating us differently without a justification that we know uh, and a rationale for why and how they're going to use that information. It's like any test you'd get from a doctor. You, you first ask, before you take the test, you, what are you going to do with the information? So I, I have no idea what they're doing with this information. I do know we pulled tests today, so we will know, we'll have some indication at least tomorrow, right? So that's good. Yes. Well, and uh, that was the part that was particularly disappointing to me because our community pool tests at, to such high extent, right. and we we are so uh, out front on these things that for the town to lift, uh, but the schools uh, not to, just didn't uh, didn't make much sense to me. But uh, what what you um, what you just said, Annie, um, about it not exactly being enforceable because the state the state is what ultimately legislates what is permissible and not i imagine desi ultimately legislates um on that issue um it, it sounds to me like um i mean i know for my <laughs> it's it's at this juncture it may just be a matter of individual choice I, i've heard from a lot of families that want to keep have their have their kids continue to keep their masks on. I know my daughter will likely continue to keep my mask, her mask on, um, but what do you do when a, a person isn't wearing a mask? That's an excellent question. And I think that people should understand that the reality is so precisely what we do if somebody is, if a student doesn't want to or 
uh, doesn't want to. It's a choice. It's not a not for medical reasons. They don't want to wear a mask. What we encourage adults to do is to have a respectful and private conversation with that student. It's, it might be just a question of a brief redirection, but if a student is just adamantly not interested in wearing a mask, we ask our adults to speak individually, privately, and respectfully with the student and to try to encourage the student to consider that local public health officials are recommending this um, and that they may want to consider adhering to those recommendations. When there was a state mass mandate, when DESE, DPH, and I believe even the governor, perhaps it was never a mass mandate here, but when there were more, there was more emphasis on wearing masks at the state level, even at that time, when we first came back to school, many superintendents asked legal counsel, and if somebody refuses to wear a mask, and it was clear then under those conditions that we would never be allowed to deny a child access to their structured learning time, remove them from class, remove them from school, if they did not wear a mask. That was even back in September of 20. Um, and so certainly, again, we would have a conversation, we try to understand the students' reasoning and encourage them to take into consideration what our local Board of Health officials are recommending, and that's all we can do. Sure, Annie, it, you know, I, I know they're busy and they're volunteers and they've been really, really helpful. Maybe it'd just be helpful to, just to find out their reasoning, just so we understand. I mean, I don't, Again, it's just a week, and I think Kumara is right. There's still going to be a lot of people that want to wear a mask regardless. And I'm happy to see the mask mandate be lifted. I think we're in a good place, and I support it. Um, so it'd just be good to know their reasoning. If they do see something, you know, if they are they looking for what is it? The, it would be the um, full testing results. I think come out tomorrow. So are they you know, curious about those? The, the, those kinds of questions would be helpful. Sure. Yeah, I'm happy to follow up with Dr. Mosler. We yeah, will know yeah. tonight, the pools will know tonight. Is it tonight? Um, and that's always good. And then individual results, if there are any positive pools. Although right. the week before break, I believe we didn't have any. I'm pretty certain we had zero positive pools again after a couple weeks of yeah, great. pools. Yeah, that's great news. Yeah. Ethan, any comment from you? No, and I, I not 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 too much to add. I think the I'm I'm kind of with the feeling of of the school committee thus far. I I do think it it feels like a precautionary measure by the board of health, and um, you know they're they're I guess within their right to do so. Um, but also I think what Annie said about us following kind of the state guidelines, the DESE guidelines, we've always kind of done that. Uh, at least more and definitely recently, we've been very committed to the science and the health data and. and you know, I think the pool testing is extremely positive. And for me, it feels like the right time. It feels like the precautions are already in place. To your point, Humera, there are gonna be plenty of families and potentially educators who continue to wear masks. Um, and I think we just have to um, continue to work together as a community. And that's one of the things that I, I've thought about the last couple of weeks as we've seen cases start to go down is that throughout this time, our, com our community has been committed to this. To, um, to this work together. Um, and, and that's the reason why our school stayed open so much last year. And that's why, in my opinion, I think we've continued to do a great job uh, as we've kind of navigated this pandemic. I agree, Ethan. Um, okay, so Annie, what you're saying is we don't necessarily have to, uh, we can we're, we're, be advised. We're, we're advised on this and no action is required. I wouldn't suggest that the school committee need to take any action at this point in time. Uh, again, I inform families of what the state recommends, the local board of health is requesting of us. Um, I encourage people to respond accordingly. And, um, and I think that's all that we can do. And I will, Paul, uh, I will follow up with Dr. Mosler regarding if there was anything specific that they were looking for this week. I hadn't heard about any data they would want from me. She has access to the dashboard, but I will find that out. That'd be great. Thanks, Annie. I have a question, Annie. Um, <clears throat> and I'm sorry if you have this in the dashboard and I haven't looked recently. Um, what is our vaccination rate at the elementary school now? Uh, give me just one second, please. Uh, it takes me no time at all. So it's one of the first things that pops up for me when I go into my drive. Here we go with your dashboard. 
So at the elementary school, um, students, this is really great, students as of my most recent information, which I would have received a report from Gail on Thursday or Friday before break, 48% of students. Staff plus students is 56%. And at Hopkins Academy, we are now at 90% of students. And when you factor in students and staff, 91%. Um, I have another follow-up, two follow-up questions. Um, have students been reporting at the uh, high school level if they've been boosted? That data we have not collected. Okay. No, I have absolutely no booster data. I believe that some people have just, I can anecdotally people mentioning to me, but we are not collecting that information. Okay. And then my other question is at the elementary school. So you have to be five or older to get vaccinated. And so we've got three and four-year-olds in the school. When we're calculating out our percent vaccinated, are we including those? We do include pre-K because there are 44 students in pre-K, but six of them are fully vaccinated. So on the dashboard, I have for every grade, the number of students vaccinated, the total number of students in the grade and the percent by grade. So it's by grade and by, and by building. Thank you. Great. All right. Um, thank you, team. Um, we can move on to the next agenda item if there are no other comments. Humera, at this time, I'm, I'm gonna have to, to take off, but I just wanted to, to thank you guys tonight for this conversation. Thank you, Ethan, for patching in for this. And um, yes, we had spoke previously. I really appreciate you joining us for that. And um, we'll see you again next month. All right, bye guys. Bye. Okay, moving on to um, presentation discussion item. Two, fiscal year 23 budget update, Annie. Yes, so their budget overview, uh, this is not the public hearing on the budget. We will do that next month. There will be uh, additional backup data and additional uh, information provided then, but I just wanted to provide you with a general overview. Um, I would say that um, I'm gonna actually ask you if you're looking at this overview, to go to page three um, and on page three, you can see by revenues, the changes to revenues and the total budget. So we, we have, we submitted in January to the town roughly a 3% increase in local contribution. Ethan and I both attended a tri-board meeting, uh, I don't know, about two weeks ago. The finance committee and the select board at that time indicated that they felt as though the request was a solid and responsible request. Uh, the town administrator, the treasurer, and other people present were complimentary of the schools, and we certainly appreciate that. You can see that we're looking to use the same amount of revenue from Circuit Breaker next year, uh, from a little less money in from ESSER funding. Um, our title grants, we anticipate will remain the same. Our 240 grant, we also anticipate will remain the same. We're looking at almost the same amount of money in school choice. Uh, we've increased the amount of money we'll use from pre-K revolving, and we anticipate the same amount of money from one of our preschool grants. Um, and we see an overall decrease in non-local revenues because we are not, we, we have some ESSER money um, earmarked for HVAC system. So we aren't using as much ESSER money in the operating budget. We also made a conscious decision not to use a tremendous amount of ESSER money in recurring expenses, right? Part of our conversation was what are things that we can do with, the, with ESSER funding that will benefit the school, but not set us up for an alarming funding cliff. This is something I can tell you that many of my colleagues are already very concerned about because they're, they're backfilling their operating budgets with ESSER money. And when the ESSER money is no longer available, they'll have a huge funding gap and a huge funding cliff. The total budget, which is total revenues, our expenses have to match our revenues. You can see the total budget is uh, less than a 1% increase. The, Increase to local contribution, however, is typically always more. 
than what the total budget increase is. Um, this uh, we have put into um, the budget some funding uh, to accomplish some of the goals that the school committee discussed in late summer, like extending our language program down to the elementary school. We started with the Spanish club, but we are hoping to um, provide even more opportunities for language learning in the elementary school. Um, and we have uh, invested in professional development, uh, certain trainings to help our teachers uh, better help students who may be struggling with reading, um, to support them in their social and emotional development. Um, we have some funding set aside for assistance from the University of Massachusetts Amherst to continue to help us with implementation of positive behavior frameworks and to provide clinical supervision for our behavioral health staff. staff. We do have uh, some additional money to curriculum up in improvements and to purchasing new textbooks in several subjects. Um, and of course, we always have money in the budget for tuitions for students who attend special education private schools and for students who attend career and tech education. Um, and I think that's the, really the big picture. I did want to point one thing out um, on the second page in the overview on the second line in psychological services. It reads as a $77,000 increase. I just want you to know that actually Chris and I had a staff member in the wrong bucket. We had a behavioral health staff um, in the teacher's line previously. So it isn't an additional position in that line. It's just that previously that that FTE full-time equivalent was under elementary and secondary teaching services. And we just uh, moved it to where it belonged because it is a behavioral health staff that belongs under psychological services. Um, and again, this is just a 30,000 foot view and the public hearing on the budget is at our March 28th meeting and um, with town meeting the first Thursday in May. Great, Annie, the uh, only question I have is um, with respect to the one that you just raised. Um, if the budget is going up by that amount in this line item, does it is it going down in another? No, that's category? always a tricky one there. And the reason why is when you think about elementary ed education and teaching services, so that's where everybody, the only ones that aren't in that would be like the library media specialists, the school nurses of special lines. So then otherwise think about all of your paraprofessionals, all of your teaching staff. So the reason you don't see a direct correspondence here is because you have to take into consideration step and lane changes, COLA and things like that. So you, it just wouldn't work out that way because the volume is so much higher on that other line. In the psychological services line, it pops out because there are very few, we're a tiny district, so there are far fewer FTEs in that line. Does that make sense? Yes. So that amount came out of that, but there are other things that increased that line, which is why you don't see an exact match. Okay. Um, other questions from Paul or Tara? So Annie, just looking through, this is really helpful, the presentation, thank you. So there, I just see some big switches or big swings and a couple other rows, just curious, um, sure. like paraprofessionals, custodial services, I mean, they're, they're relatively smaller budgets, so it's just a matter of one or two people leaving, is that kind of thing? Is that why they changed? Yeah, so that can be. So sometimes, particularly if we take the paraprofessional line, for example, what can happen in the paraprofessional line is that if we have a student who has a one-to-one -one and that student ends up uh, going to a different program, then we would see that decrease in paraprofessionals. So that, that often is what we see there. Um, in custodial services, um, yeah, so we 
did have in custodial services, we, no, Chris, are you, I'm trying to think here of the change in custodial services. Actually, I'll pull up my. I was just, sure. I mean, I'm not so, I don't need that level. Of, I'm just little things like um, textbooks. Why did text time? Well, because there are, that I can tell you that there are a number of courses, a number of subjects where um, we are looking to replace or purchase new textbooks. Um, and so I am going to just run really quickly down to the textbook line and I can tell you what some of those are. I know world languages, um, uh, English language arts at the elementary. So elementary reading, we're looking right now, they have a committee together that's looking at adopting a new textbook at the elementary in English language arts. Um, some replacement texts in math, elementary math. Um, and uh, also um, elementary social science and history. And then world languages, an increase in world languages, um, some new textbooks being purchased there. So there were a number of, um, of courses that were looking for replacement or new texts. Sure. And then heating of buildings, that's no surprise. The oil went up 25%. No, yeah, and, and sadly, what, Chris and I budgeted for in that was an increase of 25%. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, I think enough. the last time, oh gosh, I think the last time that before this week, actually before what, what has unfolded in the Ukraine, uh, we, the increase would have been 50% if we tried to lock in that day. And that was wow. before the invasion of Ukraine and sanctions. So, wow. um, something that, I mean, not to start the conversation publicly now, uh, Oh, Chris isn't with us. I don't know where he went to. Uh, but Chris and I will be talking tomorrow. Oh, there you are, right in front of me. Yeah. My goodness. Uh, I was looking to read your name. We will be talking, and spoiler alert, Chris, we will be talking about at some point this week, trying to figure out if at this point in time, locking in is even really, I mean, sure. just wait until summer, until OPEC yeah. starts producing more and see what happens. Um, yeah. And maybe what we end up doing and not locking in at this point. Definitely sure. not locking in at this moment. And Chris, yeah. did you know weigh in on custodial? I'm sorry, I didn't have the answer at the tip of my tongue there, Paul. I should have, I didn't. That's okay. Yeah, um, if you remember, we had um, a contracted services, um, I guess, in the budget last year to clean the school buildings. Yeah. And then okay. yeah. that ended up being canceled. Um, and we replaced that service with a part-time custodian and Jeff Mish working in the school as well. The part-time custodian salary level is obviously lower than a full-time, as well as the number of hours is reduced as well. So yeah. that's um, that that's makes sense. You know, I do remember that now that you just told me. Yeah, that's what happened. <laughs> so, so just two more questions. <clears throat> the maintenance of grounds went up. I'm just curious, is, Chris, was that for the new field? Was, yes. yeah. <laughs> that was for that one i know that was for yeah that. figured and then it's good to see well maybe i shouldn't pass judgment but the the amount of smith folk has gone down that means fewer kids going to smith folk it does and so yeah. as as i said even at the tri board meeting folks were asking a lot of questions about school choice and the trends and revenues and students staying in and so uh, again, that level of detail will be a part of the public hearing, but I will tell yeah. you, we have seen a steady decrease. We do support the choices that family makes, that every family sure. makes, we absolutely sure. support that. But it's, it feels good because, um, not because we wanna dissuade families from making choices, but we like to have diverse and robust offerings. I mean, we've made some really conscious efforts around early college, high school and innovation pathways. So I, right. I feel like students are, finding things that, that, and staying with us. We did see a teeny tiny uptick, but when I say teeny, well, maybe it wasn't teeny tiny, but we, we still see this steady climb in our charter school enrollments. And that kind of drives me bananas, but <laughs> just because I, I wanna keep our students, again, respecting families' choices. And in sure. terms of school choice, um, really in the last three years. And I just have to take my hat off to our administrators, our, our principals, our building principals. That has just been incredible. I mean, we hit a high point 
of something like 114, I think, uh, two years ago, or and we're still at 108. And COVID, and that that's huge. I mean, COVID disrupted public school enrollments all across the country mm-hmm. and in the Commonwealth. And so we're still our school choice receiving students choosing Hadley Public Schools has stayed really high and students choosing, choosing out of Hadley continues to go down. And the gap, you'll see a graph next month, like we want that to look like a giant crocodile mouth, right? It's just one going up and one going down. And it's starting to look that way, um, yeah. which is, that's, a, that's wonderful. It's good to see that. Yeah. And sadly, yeah. our foundation enrollment so foundation enrollment is what drives the money that the town gets. Foundation enrollment is simply the students that live in Hadley, the students for whom the town is fiscally responsible. It doesn't matter if they choice in, choice out. It's not your actual enrollment, it's the students who live here. And that decreased from FY21. So uh, yeah, FY21, that increased between the last two October one counts uh, 10 one, 20 would be driving this and 10 one, 19. Anyways, those last two uh, October one counts that incre- decreased by I think over 20 kids. That wow. foundation enrollment, that just has to do with who's living here. Yeah. Uh, so we're doing a good job of attracting people through school choice, but it is a little, that's always un- unsettling, but we'll get more yeah. into those graphs next month. And for you. the viewing public that um, just ha- hasn't followed a little long on the conversation of who uh, has to having to do with who's living here, two things are driving that. There's a population decline at large, not just in Hadley, but throughout the nation. So fewer people are having children, fewer children are enrolling in public schools, and fewer people are moving into Hadley who have young children. Um, you know, this is a this is an issue that a lot of people talk about in other committees, affordability of Hadley, but young families moving to Hadley is harder and harder. Um, so that's, that is the factor uh, driving young people coming to the schools. But it's um, very heartening to hear that our foundation budget has um, been, uh, well, that our uh, um, charter, fewer and fewer students are leaving for vocational schools. Um, and. Uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing the data next month. Great, I'm going graph and chart crazy. So it'll be an exciting March 28th, don't miss it. <laughs> Terrific. I'll be in my Excel glory. Thank you, Annie, for keeping us posted on the budget. And also just, um, so you said the March meeting is the public hearing for the budget that we'll be presenting to the town. And Correct. that will be at the March 28th. Meeting. March 28th. So that one is pretty important in terms of having a quorum. Remember, the town cannot vote on a budget that the school committee has not approved. Okay. Uh, we still have April. If something were to go awry. But just try to get it done, uh, and probably try to get it done before the election as well. Great. Thank you. Um, school choice slots. That's the next item on the presentation yep. and discussion items. Um, over to you, Annie. Yeah, so hopefully if you click on that, this makes sense. The current grade enrollments, what the grade is, the estimated or the target enrollment. The reason you say NA next to kindergarten is those estimated enrollments have to do with, we wait until we get the census numbers. Um, And so we don't, we aren't at this time recommending school choice even in K1, we don't have those census numbers. And two, we have really high pre-K enrollment right now. So um, we may be coming back to you to request opening up slots in K, but we're just not doing that at this point. What you can see for Hadley Elementary is that um, essentially for the most part in almost every grade, they're looking pretty in the grade, the class sizes of roughly 20. There's one grade, so sometimes uh, the teachers and the the administration will take into consideration if uh, a class has particular needs that, um, that make us wanna keep the class the grade a little bit smaller. And you can see at Hopkins Academy, same thing, the current enrollments, um, our estimated enrollment, and then the slots available, looking at it, uh, shooting for 55 students per grade. 
And this is something that the school committee has to approve by law before we can open up those slots. Okay, great. Um, and in terms of those seats, they are, um, uh, so column D are the seats that we would be approving. Um, and those aren't dramatically different from previous years. Can you just comment a bit on the zero seats, additional seats on uh, for, for grade three? Can you tell me a little bit about yeah, that? Yeah, so that's just, um, just looking at the needs of the current, what the incoming third graders. And um, it isn't a, a decision that Jen Dowd makes unilaterally. She talks with teachers, she talks with behavioral health staff and with others. And then sometimes it just, um, and it doesn't mean forever that we're saying we'll always close the door on this grade, but uh, we also take into consideration kind of the de developmental stage a student might be in, the demands of a particular grade. So if we have students that may have um, some just more needs at this point at this point in time, then um, and they're going into a grade that is third grade is hard. Right, everything, everything kind of changes, big change. So that's what that recommendation is about. But again, that could look different when they're entering fourth grade. It could look different during the year. You can always, we can always come back to you and ask you for additional school choice slots, um, at, which you'll probably hear from us around kindergarten when we have more information. Great. Any other questions or comments for Annie on the school choice seats? Okay, seeing none. So I'm sorry, in, sorry, Humair, just oh. one. So we've done in the past where we've, um, I know it feels kind of weird, but we've advertised and put the word out. Is there any plans for similar means this time? So we, I can't remember if we put, oh, we put something in the, we put it in the newspaper. I'm trying to think of our, I know we put it on the website. I mean, the applications on the website, and there have been years that we have really advertised. Um, at this point in time, we were just planning on doing what we have been doing, right? Which is mostly just website and word of mouth. Um, we didn't have plans to do anything drastically different. What about an open house? Like when you go to a college, right? You, open house where people can come and Take a look. Have we done that before? Do you know, we have not done that for, um, we haven't done that. And yeah, it's, I don't want to get ahead of myself. That's kind of an interesting thought. Um, that's definitely an interesting thought for, particularly for Hopkins. Um, we didn't do, and Hopkins, it's harder to attract students for really for no other reason than there's so much more competition, right? So you have vocational schools, you have several of our right. charter schools don't start until seventh grade, right? In some cases, yeah. they're, um, so it's, it's harder. Uh, there's more competition and it's harder to attract students. So you're saying that we have leadership team this week, every Wednesday. And we didn't do a traditional open house because of COVID. So there may be right. room there even to do something a little bit different, right? This year in the spring. Yeah. I know the charter be... schools around town do that. They'll have an orientation open house day. You go visit and walk around That's the classrooms. That's where they're taking all my students now. That's right. <laughs> Yeah, and even, you know, an in-person one sounds great. And even if it was, a, if there was a virtual one as well, a quick 30 minutes, mm -hmm. even record the, the session. Um, mm -hmm. One thing separate from the open house idea, which is a great one, is um, if you were to create a social media blurb about the opportunity to come to Hopkins and participate in some of the great um, or the innovation uh, uh, pipeline offerings that uh, that could be something that we could all share. I know we all have very extensive networks um, in the local community and there's so many supportive um, parents who also have great networks in the broader community. Um, we could get some, you know, word of mouth going uh, through our social media channels. Yeah, that's actually, that's a great idea too. And I know that April Camuso has um, done, she has her Hopkins 
Facebook and her Facebook kind of town hall that she does or Facebook live that she does with the principal. I'm actually going to make it myself a note. Yeah. Even if it's like a four sentence, really quick, um, really playing up the highlights of what becomes unlocked for public school students by, you know, it's really, we do have a very differentiated offering and I'm not sure it's very well known, especially in terms of those two new programs that you um, helped bring about Annie. So if we, yeah, that, that would be great. Posting it on Facebook, for instance. And then from there, we can, you know, send, send us an email that it's live and ready to go and we'll push it out. Yeah, good idea. Absolutely. And um, yeah, and I would be remiss if um, I didn't uh, acknowledge how well school choice is going at Hadley Elementary School. And I really do believe that uh, all of the faculty and staff there, and I really do believe that Principal Dowd's leadership has just made a fundamental difference in terms of school choice. Um, well, well, there too is an opportunity to really play up the early uh, ch early childhood language program that we have, that students from K through six can be exposed to Spanish. That's, that's really not very typical. And um, if we were to... Um, have a separate blurb because parents, you know, of of course they they hang out with like you know uh, mm -hmm. like parents who have you know young children or older children. So separate Facebook posts that we could circulate amongst the younger population that might be a really good way to fill the um, Hadley Elementary seats. Yeah, absolutely. I um, I'm laughing to myself, and I just realized that I hadn't made um, Corey Dowd. That's actually Jen Dowd, a mm -hmm. uh, co-host. But uh, yeah, okay, Jen, we're gonna have to ask April how to do all that stuff. All right. <laughs> They're both like, oh my gosh. I was don't... waiting to be unmuted for a while. Oh, <laughs> funny. Yelling at the computer going, we have so many great things that we wanna highlight at Hadley Elementary School. <laughs> And See, this is why I can't do the social media. No, that's okay. okay. That's media. okay. That's okay. No, I'm I'm so excited that you guys are saying some of the same things that our staff has been sharing with me. And we we had a plan prior to COVID. Um, we actually had a preschool orient preschool kindergarten orientation night set up, yeah. and we canceled it mm -hmm. for. Um, it was a week before the closure. And so it was one of our first events that we actually had to shut down, unfortunately. And we were so upset because we advertised and highlighted and we had a lot of families that were excited to come. And so we want to begin that work again. Um, I'd love to be able to do a summer, you know, pre-summer event, you know, maybe closer to the end of the school year. Families are already reaching out and, and asking me about tours and coming in to see the building, which now hopefully we'll be able to do. Um, at a greater frequency. So we're excited. This is, we've been talking about getting more families in. Our school choice families that we currently have are, are thrilled um, and really feel like they're a part of our community. And so we're just, we want to highlight that. Word of mouth has helped us greatly, um, being one of the only schools that has been open. Um, we have, we have really had a lot of uh, interest in our, in our grade levels. So we're excited about that. It's great, Jen. Great. That's really good. Thank you, Jen. Part of me almost thinks we should do a uh, lottery like um, PVPA. We absolutely could do that. Um, and I, I believe that at some point we probably will get to that point where we can yeah. do a lottery. Um, I just don't want to discourage families at this point. We have lots yeah. of open seats. Um, I know. And, and you can see, but but I do see, you know, getting a golden ticket to come right. and be a golden hawk right. is really something that would be, oh, I like that. you know, wonderful that we could, um, we could, we could just celebrate. So yeah. um, and, um, they are really excited and we try to um, make them feel as welcome <laughs> as, and as lucky as possible. But I, I do see that there is, um, you know, there, there could be some, some fun, creative ways to do a lottery type system, but we just want as many kids, we're happy when we get as many kids as we possibly can um, in our Hadley schools. That's great, thank you. And, and just a final note, Annie, we won't need to all be as amazing as Jen Dowd is, uh, oh, sorry, as um, April Camuso is in our web presence and, 
and um, live streaming skills. Um, in fact, in order to circulate social media posts, you don't even have to have a presence on Facebook. You don't have to have a Facebook page or anything of that nature. Um, if you were to just send us a, a little blurb and a photo, we could probably get things going for you on the elementary school side. That's fantastic. <laughs> so that's you. Jen and I don't have to do Facebook town hall. <laughs> exactly. We can do that for you. We, Every we once in a that. while, April brings me into her town halls. So I, I have <laughs> I've been town forced, hall interloper. <laughs> I have been forced to participate in some, but I, but I do appreciate um, Humera, you know, the acknowledgement that it is a team approach to getting out the message and the word and how great things are happening in the school. And I am looking forward to, to being able to, to talk about our Spanish program, to talk about, you know, our enhancement of our STEAM lab, you know, opportunities and things of that nature. I really do think that's going to set us apart from other small school districts. Great. Thank you, team. Okay. Um, so, Annie, should, do you want to vote, need to vote now? Yes, please. Okay. And you can just vote it as presented. You don't have to vote each line. All right. Um, do I hear a motion to present the school choice slots as presented? So moved. Seconded. And all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Motion passes. Thank you, everyone. And on to the business manager reports. Chris, are you still with us? Oops, I'm here. Yep. <laughs> Great. Okay, so I have three reports for you tonight. Uh, the first would be the expense report. Um, basically just showing the expenses from the regular school budget. Um, as, uh, as I've said for the past few months, I hate to be boring with this, but I guess boring is always good when it comes to talking about the budget. And in this case, there's really not a heck of a lot to highlight. Um, we're pretty much right where we expect to be at this point in time of the year. Again, some accounts are over, some are under, depending on, uh, you know, things like, say, Electricity, um, you know, expense goes up, um, oil expense goes up, and then we have something like, oh, a, a tuition account goes down. So, uh, you know, ultimately they've done a nice job this year of kind of washing each other out. And, um, you know, that's reflected in the balance that we have remaining for the rest of the year. So I don't know if anybody has any questions on this um, at this point in time. Okay. Um, I do not, no. Okay. All right, um, with that, I could move on, I guess, to the grant report, which we have um, uh, you know, a whole lot of grants, um, as I said last month, and we're using uh, a little more of them. Some of these grants, um, things like the ESSER two and ESSER three, will go on to next year without being fully spent. Um, and that's by design, not by the inability to spend them. Um, Others, we, we had a number of summer grants this year that um, enabled us to offset the summer school expenses with these particular grants. Um, three of them are already fully used up, the 117, 120, and 121. Um, the 437 is uh, the final summer grant. Even though it shows that nothing's been spent, um, we're at this point, we're just, um, we know we were approved for the grant. We just haven't received the official notice for it yet. And unfortunately, I need that official notice to have the town set up the account for it. So uh, until we uh, get that, we're reaching out to them just to see if they can give us something official. Um, then I'll transfer another $11,000 of expenses from the regular budget that we already spent to use that grant up in full. Um, and there will be a, a number of transfers of expenses to these grants as the year goes on. <clears throat> um, you know, one of the trickier ones would be something like the 240 special ed grant. That's one of our bigger grants that we get. And the tricky part is that in the beginning of the school year, you may end up slotting one of the students to have their tuition to be paid out of this grant. And then all of a sudden they, you know, they, they may move or something and it's just a case of now we don't have that particular student being paid from the grant. So um, that's one of those things that I'll be just going over carefully in the next couple of months, just to make sure that we use that grant in full. Um, so don't, it's no cause for alarm if they're not fully spent or, or spent say three quarters down, 
um, at this point in the year. They will be fully spent by the end of the year. Um, so I don't know if anyone has any questions on the grants. I'm just impressed that that list keeps getting longer and longer. Um, I'm going to need two sheets pretty soon, uh, Chris, to talk about this. So the um, what is? Can you remind me what's the 216 teacher diversification pilot program? That is a new grant. Um, Anne applied for that. She may yeah. be better to answer the question than I would. Yeah, thanks. You got, they took the custodians. I can do 216. That is uh, the grant that's really the future educator pathway. You, were you, I'm not sure if you were here when we talked about that. So um, it will allow students this year, we'll get a sense of how many students are interested in having that as a consistent pathway. And it will mm -hmm. pay for um, kind of convening those students, have them connect with an education student at UMass, a college student in who's uh, majoring in education at UMass to kind of run a future educators program. And we'll also pay for an undergraduate credit bearing course at UMass um, that will help students who are interested in becoming teachers understand better how to teach and uh, pedagogical techniques that will um, help work with students from diverse backgrounds. Um, so uh, that's what those funds will pay for. And field trips to, well, field trip isn't really, campus visits to UMass and perhaps some community colleges as well. Great, sounds really that's, cool. That's really neat. It, it, it's yeah. sort of like a innovation pathways program for young educators or, or students who wanna become teachers. Um, another thing to promote in that social media post, I would say. Yeah, right, that's great. Yeah. A lot of summer stuff, summer expansion, summer acceleration, summer programming. It's great. I didn't, I didn't have to measure desks. I didn't know what to do with myself when I didn't have to measure desk on every classroom, like, literally, like I did in the summer of 20. You think I'm kidding? I'm like, wow, look at all the time I would have made it. I think I'll write 50 grants. So that's what I did. It's great. Nice Are you still time. batting, batting 100, batting 1,000? Yeah. Nice. Dang. Yeah. Everything funded so far. You should buy a lottery ticket. With that <laughs> one. Yeah. I guess even better, she should buy me one. That would be, uh, I, I'd prefer that. I, I, I have some friends that are lucky like that. So uh, yeah, although in this me. case, it's not really luck, but yeah. Um, uh, any Great. other questions on the grants or anything? No other questions. OK, we can move on to the revolving accounts then. Um, Basically, um, a lot of these is really not a, a lot of movement between um, uh, December and January as far as these go. Little downtick in athletic, um, uptick in lunch, little down in preschool, up in student activity. It's like the little roller coaster back and forth. Um, but basically, all of these are in good shape. Um, it's it's nice, even though we had a uh, say a drop down in something like the lunch account, the preschool account. Um, over the summer, by the time the summer comes and, and winds down, we should be pretty close to uh, where we started the year at, which is nice to see. Um, the, the payments are always a couple of months behind, so uh, we'll see those payments come in over the summer. Diane has been doing a great job of bringing uh, those revenues in, you know, making sure we get credit for all of those lunches. And I, I still don't think we know if the lunches would be free next year. Um, fingers are crossed for that because it's uh, it's a great program. So um, I don't know if anyone's on, anyone has any questions on the revolving accounts. Chris, do we know how much more we're going to need to use from School Choice? Um, the answer is no, um, <laughs> but but we have an estimate. Uh, you know, I mean, I guess it just yeah. depends on um, you know how the rest of the year goes. Obviously. We've used some of the funds up to now, just um, I think it was in December um, to offset some of the expenses year to date. We budgeted um, around $800,000 to be spent and we used uh, 500,000 so far. And um, I would not use the full 800,000. Um, I'm, I'm guessing maybe another um, 100, uh, 100,000 to 150,000. Uh, would be my my estimate at this point in time. Okay, yeah, thanks. Great, thank you, Chris. Okay, thank you. All right, 
Um, we are at school committee reports and discussion items and um, finance. Um, Ethan is not here, um, but Annie, are you aware if there was a finance meeting? Um, yes. And basically what I'd said before that the town, the tri board meeting is the last one that Ethan I and I attended and the finance committee at this point in time and the select board seemed um, pleased with the requests that came from the school department. So I don't foresee any issues with the budget as it currently stands. Great, um, as it relates to policy, um, Tara. Oh, I'm unmuted. Um, we did not meet tonight. So hopefully, uh, I think we anticipate meeting next month. So we'll have an update then. Great. Um, Heather is not here. So we'll get a, a CES report at the next meeting. And um, Tara, for negotiations. Yep, we um, have not met in a few weeks. We meet again tomorrow. Hopefully, um, we're able to wrap things up tomorrow would be ideal. Great. And finally, fields and capital, Paul. Actually, just a couple of questions for Annie and Chris. So one on the fields, I know we're waiting on Berkshire Design to come with us for their first design for the second phase, right? I haven't talked to Carlos, okay. Is it worth, Chris, me checking in with Carlos to see how that's going? Um, I actually spoke with Carlos last week and he go. was on site. Um, awesome with someone just doing some surveying and measuring to get some preliminary um, okay. you know, figures in their system. So um, he is moving on it. I mean, I think one of those things about um, waiting for the weather to kind of clear up, like they're gonna have okay. to do soil samples and things like that. Yeah. Um, but he is working on it now. Great, awesome. Then Annie, the, we had put out that contract for you, Chris, the, to, for that company to come and do the facilities assessment. Right. Yes, I actually reached out to them today. I haven't heard back yet, but it was okay. it was this afternoon when I sent them an email just to see uh, if they were ready to roll with kind of, okay. kind of bringing or sending a draft to us and then and bringing it out to you guys for your um, basically for your approval. Have they done I think the we had yeah. I, I I think that they had initially told us it would be beginning of March, which is almost as, and we had planned ah. to present the report at the March meeting. But I think that gotcha. the timeline that they gave us, I'm trying to recall the proposal from memory, but I think the timeline they gave us said that we should have a report at the beginning of March, within the first two weeks of March. Great. Okay. Right? Or is that when they were doing it, Chris? Yeah, they. I thought they said the final report was going to be um, around March 14th. Um, okay, so that's but that's. I, 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 yeah. I'd be looking for a draft at this point in time, just to kind of uh, you know see where they stand on it. So they've been really good and, and very responsive. I would assume you know okay. because I emailed them at three this afternoon, I wouldn't necessarily expect a response, but I'm sure, sure. they'll get back to me tomorrow. That's great. I'm really excited to see their report. I'm really interested in seeing that. So with the phase two for the the fields, going back to that, Annie, I know you'd reached out to folks at the CPA. They only meet, I think it seems like twice a year. They're meeting again. Okay. Next September. So our timeline, it's good for me to say this out loud. So it's, what's really important with our timeline is that we have something, their meeting will be in September, right? They said early September. Yeah. That, I believe that's what it was. So right. we want to make sure that our um, application to the CPA is in front of the school committee that all of you have seen it and agree to it no later than their, our August meeting. Um, yeah. yeah, so that we can bring that to the CPA in September, Makes which sense. means that part of what we want for that, for the application is the information that we'll get from Carlos. So just at some point in the summer, but no later than August, the school committee will have to review the application and then uh, it's in my calendar and then we go to the CPA in September. Okay, thank you. Great. Just speaking of timelines too, Humera, just just uh, the town elections are coming up this April, right? And there is one potentially going to be one seat right on the school committee. Running for election again. Her son Bobby graduated last year, and her term is up. She's faithfully served our committee for, I believe, three terms. Yeah, I think that. Uh, and we are uh, we so we have an open seat, and um, I haven't heard of anyone pulling papers. I know there's still time to do that. Um, so if you know someone 
who's um, passionate about education and um, willing to invest the time. I hear we pay, the money is really <laughs> not great. exactly there, but, um, but there, there are so many other rewards. It's the fame and the uh, glory. <laughs> That's right. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, thank you, Tamara, for reminding us. Yeah, I think they'd have to pull papers pretty quickly. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and if anyone out there is interested in learning more about it, you know, feel free to contact any one of us. Our contact information is on the school website. We're happy to take a call and, and share with you the realistic level of workload. It will never be as high as it was during the pandemic. Um, and actually, um, it is, uh, I've found it to become quite manageable um, over the years. Um, we've, I, I feel as though we've really put in place some solid systems that are repeatable and you can trace, you know, look back at, um, at, at previous things. And so there's a lot, um, a lot of tools in place that allow someone to hit the ground running and um, uh, contribute from from day one or learn from day one um, and and also contribute. Great. All right. Um, we're at the part of our agenda where we have any other announcements. That was a great one. Thank you, Paul. Um, are there any other announcements? No. Okay, great. So action items. I think we have some minutes and warrants to approve. We'll start with the minutes of January 24th, 2022. Do I hear a motion to approve those? So moved. Seconded. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, and then the approval of the AP warrants for January 2022. So Do I hear a motion? So moved. Is that the one I abstained from or no? Uh, AP warrants, yes, let me just, I can always tell by the order. Um, AP would be accounts payable, uh, not payroll. Not payroll, so you can vote on this one. Thank you, Chris, you can okay. vote on this one. So seconded. Okay, and all in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, approval of, of warrants for January, 2022. I think this is the one, Paul, that you abstain from. Mm -hmm. Tara, do you wanna make a motion? Oh, I'll moved. And I'll second it. And um, can we can we yes, pass that one? Yeah. Okay. You All can. in favor. Uh, Aye. You can because okay. Paul abstains from it, so it's the majority still carries it. Okay. Excellent. Um, and then finally, approval of school choice slots. For, and I think we already made that motion, so we're good there. Okay. Next meeting dates are uh, March twenty eighth at five p.m. for the policy subcommittee subcommittee meeting and then 5.30 for the regular school committee meeting. And with that, do I hear a motion to adjourn? So moved. Seconded. And all in favor, aye. Aye. Thanks everybody. Okay. It's an honorary in favor, aye, me too. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thanks. Everybody.